I'm Ben Apker. I'm over here at MightyGen. Uh, and, and luckily, I'm actually back in the office today. So I'm hosting this virtual booth. Um, the, the reason for this is that typically this time of year, you'd see us at M&M or ACA or one of these big meetings. And uh, we have a lot of fun with those. We get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with our customers. And we get to show off all the things we've developed over the past year or two. So behind me, I've got the equivalent of a virtual booth. The best I could do it in, in our offices here, uh, where I've got some of the different technologies that we have and that we can offer for CrowEM. And so my plan for today is to walk us through uh, a short slide deck with uh, an overview of a lot of the stuff that's behind me. And then I have a bird's eye view camera set up behind me that will serve as the virtual booth portion where I will give some hands-on demonstrations for the different tech that we have and talk a little bit about how it works. But we've got uh, an overview of just some of our cryo-em sample prep technologies. And uh, our general goal is to focus on uh, developing tools for easier grid preparation, storage, and tracking. And so first, just a little bit about Mitogen. So we were founded in 2004 and we are in Ithaca, New York, so near Cornell University. So uh, Robert Thorne, who's a physics professor at Cornell, founded Mitogen, and uh, to this date, it is still scientist owned and operated. Uh, our focus early on was on developing technologies around sample prep and data collection for X-ray crystallography. And we've recently developed some more for CryoEM as the community has pivoted a bit. Um, we've got particular interests around sample preparation, sample handling, and cryocooling. Um, and we utilize uh, a strong background in a lot of advanced manufacturing techniques, such as microfabrication, 3D printing, and uh, you know, uh, EDM and some other things that allow us to develop some really neat technologies. So, so coupled with our scientific background and our ability and understanding of these methodologies, we've developed lots of, of cool tech for crystallography. So with Roots in Crystallography, we have uh, a full suite of products from once you've purified your protein to how you get your data collection. So whether this is crystallization screens and crystallization plates or um, hardware for crystal harvesting or for crowd protecting, uh, we also developed the first cryo cooling system for crystallography. So this is the Nanook and this is uh, sort of the equivalent to a Vitrobot in cryoEM, but it does automated sample plunging and sample placement um, in liquid nitrogen utilizing some patented technologies around cold gas layer removal to maximize the cooling rate. Uh, we've also got a lot of experience around cryogenic transport and then on the data collection side of things. But I'll, I'll spare you a lot of crystallography talk because this is focused on cryoEM. Just wanted to pay a little homage to where our roots are. And so within cryoEM, over the past few years, we've seen a, a big uptick of our users having an interest in cryoEM, but some of them have struggled to understand where to get started or what to do. And so uh, our attention has been spent on trying to decrease the barriers of entry for folks to get started in cryoEM, along with developing sample handling and sample storage technologies that just improve the chance of success um, and also make the, the prep workflow a bit easier. So that if our users can come into cryoEM and have success early on and get the structures that they're looking for, then they'll have a, a better chance of adopting it as another tool in their toolbox. And so in doing this, we've um, looked at a lot of the processes in the workflow. So how the grids are handled, how the grids are crowd cooled, how they're stored and developed uh, improvements or partnered with companies that offer improvements for those. And because we've realized in crystallography that offering the accessories and other things that they might need during the time when they're purchasing those interesting technologies, we've tried to become a bit of a one-stop shop for the majority of materials and consumables and equipment that you might need uh, if you're going to get started in cryo-EM and, and, and give it a go. So I'm just going to walk you through what some of these technologies are uh, prior to, to pivoting behind us. And so uh, we offer things from grid and grid preparation through improving the sample vitrification, and as I've mentioned, the sample storage and transport, uh, as well as a bunch of cryogen storage and handling equipment. And so with respect to grids and grid preparation, uh, we have looked at what the pain points are in the industry, which uh, if you're actively doing cryo-EM, you could probably agree that just getting your hands on grids has been a challenge. Um, and there are a variety of, of good grids out there uh, between C-flat and Quantifoil, and so, the way that we've helped alleviate this early on is that we've partnered with a variety of manufacturers and companies 
to be able to provide quick access to the grids that are in demand. Uh, and we now have you know, some inventory of some of the most sought after grids, but we've expanded to offer all of the routine sample prep grids such as negative stain, um, holy carbon, holy gold, gold on gold. Um, you, you, if, you, if you're in this space, you understand that there's a large variety there. And so we're doing our best to provide a network that can get you the grids you need when you need them. Um, and we also have a lot of vision for ways that the grids themselves can be improved in the way that that can improve the data collection. Uh, but we don't have anything specific to, to show right at this point. Um, so for the next step, if you have grids, the, the challenge is you have to prepare those grids and that uh, you might have, um, so, so standard routine is you just glow discharge grids in air and that makes it so that they're a bit more hydrophilic and that your, your sample and solution is going to wet onto the grid. Well, uh, a pain point that we heard about early on is that you know, certain molecules may require a special surface condition. They may have a preferred orientation or a, a confirmation state that they seem to come out of or into uh, when they're on the grid themselves. And so uh, we partnered to offer the glow cube system, which we find to be the best glow discharge system in that it's dual chamber. So it's got one chamber that is just air and it's gonna do your standard hydrophilic cleaning. Uh, the other is, um, a, a secondary chamber where you can do either negative or positive surface treatment to give you uh, um, charges that are opposite of what your molecules are to try to get preferred adhesion. Uh, so this would be a alkylamine or a, a for negative molecules or methanol for, for positive. So um, there's a lot of opportunity just to start to play around with improving vitrification just by what you do to the surface treatment of your grid. Um, and so, in addition to the surface treatment of the grid itself, there's also, we offer a vitrification starter kit, which is a suite of different surfactants and crowd protectants and different types of grids that uh, will allow you to search around for the optimal vitrification solutions for your, your target protein or molecule. Um, uh, certain molecules may have, a, you know, like I said, a, a charge that is got a preferred orientation, or maybe they've got issues with aggregating or binding to the grid, and different um, surfactants can help spread those out or get uh, surface adhesion. And so this is sort of an assay where you get uh, 10 different cryoprotectants or surfactants that you can play around with with your protein, combined with the variety of different uh, quantifoil holy carbon grids. So these would be just your standard carbon foil on copper or some with continuous layers of carbon and what this allows is for you to, to just understand and trial early on what combination of chemistry space plus molecule plus grids may give you uh, some preferred vitrification. Uh, in addition, so once you've got your, you've got your purified protein, you've got your grids, uh, you've decided what chemistry space you might want to play with in them and what surface treatments you might want to do, then there is the whole process of vitrification. And so I'm, I'm approaching this virtual booth as though you've got some familiarity with the standard workflow for cryo-EM. Um, if you don't, and, and I'm going over things in a way that they're unfamiliar to you, uh, feel free to speak up or I'm happy to connect outside of this. Um, but general standard workflow, sample onto grid, grid into cryo-cooling device, cryo-cooling device plunge cools, transfer to cryo-grid box, uh, and then from there, uh, the preferred storage and data collection method. So we've partnered with a company called Nanosoft Materials who developed some really genius solutions to just improve sample vitrification around a vitrobot and some of the other uh, related steps around sample prep. And so um, the, the, one of the first ones that, that we brought online from them is what's called an ethane condenser. If you've got experience uh, with the standard vitrobot setup and the way that you have to fill the ethane cup, which is located in in the middle of this doer here, um, there's, a, there's a small metal cup. You would need one hand to be filling this ethane cup and another hand to be controlling uh, your um, ethane cylinder. And uh, that can be a bit challenging because you're trying to do those two things and pay attention to where your nitrogen or where your ethane level is and how fast your flow rate is. And so the ethane condenser uh, inserts firmly into the um, into the ethane cup and, and part of the spider assembly for, for a vitrobot. And it allows for you to do just focus on the, the valve control and, and monitoring the, 
uh, effing level without having to try to do two things uh, with each hand and do all of that at once. So it essentially holds the tube that is putting the ethane in the ethane cup in place without you needing to hold it in with your hand. Um, so, so a simple tool, but again, uh, just a, an easy solution to, to help address a, a small pain point in sample prep. Uh, the next is, is a pretty ingenious idea. And so if you've ever worked with the VitroBot before, the standard methodology to prepare your grids would be to um, take the standard VitroBot tweezers and uh, utilizing the metal dovetail, align it to the plunger mechanism of the VitroBot. So that would be uh, what's shown here. Uh, so this metal dovetail would go onto this plunger mechanism and you have to fight with that to get that on there sometimes. And then to actually get the tweezers to hold the grid, you have to uh, manipulate what we call an O-ring or a slider up and down the tweezers to hold the grid in place. So the, the tweezers are naturally in an open position and you have to pinch this delicate grid with these tweezers by sliding this uh, O-ring up and down. Um, uh, if you've got any experience with this, you know that this can be a pain point and challenging because you've got very delicate, uh, thin carbon film grids and you're trying to hold them and do all these manipulations uh, often over top of a, a cryogen like liquid ethane. And so the technology that they've developed is a, the NanoSoft cryo tweezer. And this tweezer has, uh, addresses the two pain points uh, readily. So rather than having the metallic dovetail that needs to be mechanically slid into place, they've put a, a clamp mechanism on the end of the tweezer. And this clamp mechanism, it actuates somewhat like a, a clothespin. And so you can open this clamp up, slide it onto the plunger, and then close it, and it's held securely in there. And so this makes sticking it on easy and taking it off you know, even easier once you're over top of the cryogen. Then to address the issue of having to slide the O-ring up and down the tweezer, uh, the novel solution was, we'll just use a reverse action tweezers, so ones that are in a natural state of holding the grid, rather than having to manipulate whether or not it's holding the grid. So you squeeze the, the tweezers open, you can then pick up your grid, and then when you let go of the tweezers, it holds it, and there's no secondary manipulation needing two hands to try to get the uh, assembly on the plunger and the grid held in place, and then all of that then needs reversed when you're trying to deposit the grid into a grid box. Um, and so grid assembly goes on, you uh, pipette your protein sample onto the, the grid and then you plunge cool. And then the next step is you have to transfer from these tweezers, your grid into a crowd grid box. And so um, one challenge there uh, is that, and, and I trust that many of you are familiar with this, is that you have a small ethane cup in the middle of your plunge doer. And then you need to transfer your grid up and out of liquid cryogen into cryogenically temperature air, and then into liquid nitrogen where you can then deposit it into your cryo grid box and then do all of the subsequent manipulations from there. Well, uh, these are really thin samples and these are really sensitive to variations in temperature. And so you have large local variability in the sample environment where uh, you may, if a standard doer comes open and it may be that you have a turbulent airflow or that it's very humid in the lab and you're getting contamination in your cryogens, so what NanoSoft has developed is the, the Igloo. Uh, it is a plastic lid that affixes on top of the plunge doer that comes standard with the, the VitroBot. And what it does is it controls the environment over top. So you can imagine that it's gonna reduce ambient air and turbulent air from changing the, uh, the area right above the liquid cryogen. And so you can get a defined cold gas layer so that when you're transferring your, your grid from liquid ethane to liquid propane, you know that it stays within cryogenic temperature atmosphere and that it's not warming up and recooling and getting ice. And so uh, users will often be preparing grids with a standard VitroBot assembly where from one grid to the next, they may do everything the exact same they believe, but you get variability. It doesn't you, you don't get the vitreous ice that you need. Maybe you have snakeskin ice or just crystalline ice. And why is that? And so one of those is that this transition from liquid ethane to uh, liquid nitrogen is critical and that any sort of variability in warming that happens in that step uh, can be detrimental. And so the igloo controls that environment. It also provides the, a secondary benefit is it's got the, this part that lifts up that's called the Cobra. It holds the, the NanoSoft cryo tweezers in place 
factoring, transferring, or moving the doer. And so that, uh, again, it takes something that historically were always require one set of steady hands and just allows it to be a bit more stable and, and improve that transfer. Um, so then you've plunge cooled, you've transferred your sample to cryo grid boxes. What do you do after that? Um, so for those who uh, were coming from crystallography, so, so about three years ago, we developed this CryoEM grid box grid box puck storage system. And it was the first puck storage system on the market. And uh, the reason we developed it is that we had a lot of users in crystallography transitioning to cryoEM and they're going from an historically high throughput sample management system in crystallography where all your samples are prepared at home and you ship them off to the synchrotron to this method of sample storage, which was 50 milliliter Falcon tubes with holes punched in them and strings that would turn into these giant nests of samples. And so there was a lot of issues with users having to try to get their samples out of a cryogenic doer in a Falcon tube and trying to figure out which grid box was where and how do they keep track of all of that. So we took our experiences with the, the puck systems and crystallography and we uh, developed this system that is designed to be cross compatible with the existing hardware in the structural biology community for crystallography. Uh, and, and we call this the Mitogen Cryoem Puck System. And so uh, these pucks use standard canes and uh, standard doers and transport systems, just like in crystallography. And so each individual puck can hold up to 12 grid boxes. Uh, every puck is individually identified. And via its own custom serial number and its own coloring and engraving. And so you can customize these pucks to have whatever alphanumeric sequence you want. And you can then uh, keep track of which users are which pucks, uh, sorry, which pucks are which users in, in the lab. And so um, some other features of our puck design is that in addition to the 12 individual wells, uh, which hold any style round cryo grid box, whether it's the white ones or the blue ones or the ones with the pin type lid or the screw lids. Um, they also have unique markings for each well on the top surface. So you can see which puck position is where. And so they're marked on the top surface and on the bottom surface. Uh, the pucks themselves have permanently affixed clear lids, which you can see here. Uh, these are screwed on and they're designed to rotate freely. And uh, there's two main advantages to having a permanently affixed lid. One is that it retains liquid nitrogen, like liquid nitrogen during sample transfer. So you load this puck up with grid boxes under liquid nitrogen. You then have to transfer this puck into your cane or your storage system. And users are, are always worried about, oh, is my sample going to warm up? Is it going to get exposed to ambient? And so we've had these on the market for three years. And um, because of having the permanently affixed lid, which helps hold liquid nitrogen in and prevent ambient air from reaching the samples, we've had zero complaints from any users about any decrease in sample quality due to ice formation during puck transfers. Um, and crystallographers are very familiar with handling pucks. Some of the researchers with just the Crowian background had a little bit of a learning curve in how to manipulate and handle pucks. But even then they realized that the amount of time that these things are being exposed to ambient uh, is absolutely minimal and that there's, there's really no concern for frost or, or ice development. And so uh, the other advantage of having uh, a clear affixed lid as opposed to, uh, sorry, uh, in addition to keeping liquid nitrogen retained is that should you accidentally flip the puck over or it become jostled during, uh, during a transport that it may, uh, your grid boxes aren't going to fall out, that they're going to stay in place and you're not gonna end up with a, a bunch of grid boxes um, randomly positioned somewhere. Um, so the lid itself freely rotates and there is a locking mechanism that holds it in place. So when you go to transfer from the doer into a storage cane, that it's simple and easy. And so the, the pucks themselves can be loaded with cryo grid boxes in a, in a standard foam doer manually or using uh, a puck doer insert that we've developed that allows you to, to easily position and transfer uh, around grid boxes. Then once you've filled your puck, it can then be transferred into a storage cane. And these storage canes have a magnetic retention mechanism. So the pucks themselves have magnets. The canes are made of magnetic stainless steel. And so that the, the pucks are held very securely in place once you, once you have them positioned. So every cane holds 10 pucks. The 
standard uh, storage doer holds six canes, so you've got 60 pucks. So you can store thousands of grids per doer in a manner where you can know whose users are in which puck, or which users' grids are in which puck, and how do you get those out quickly without having to pull out a nest of falcon tubes, dump them into a doer, and fumble around for the, the right grid box. Um, in addition to that, the after storage, so you're organized and things are easy to store, uh, you can then transfer your pucks. So uh, using the, the same approach that they do in crystallography, a puck transport cane that can be inserted into a standard uh, cryogenic dry shipper like the CX100. Um, we developed uh, this, this transport cane that allows you to ship samples all over the world for data collection. So as we see these national lab facilities pop up, you can determine which, which one might you actually get access to these high power microscopes on and send your samples off there for data collection. Um, I know firsthand that we've had users in California ship their pucks using our system to Germany for data collection. And uh, we routinely have users all over the continental US shipping pucks uh, all over the world. And so it's, it's pretty interesting and, and a simple way to do it. Um, the next step for us is a product we're bringing online soon that is a, an auto grid cassette puck. So the, the pipeline for um, sample collection is that uh, typically you'd put them in cryo grid boxes, screen them, then if you had good samples, you would then take a, a similar sample, clip it, place it into uh, a auto grid cassette box or an auto grid, sorry, an auto grid puck or they, uh, or an auto grid cassette, excuse me. Um, and so then this allows you to ship and transport your auto grid cassettes like you would uh, a standard puck with cryo grid boxes. So um, here's an image of it being inserted into a standard cryo cane that would use the cryo AM pucks, but you could also send it in the transport cane. So an accessory to the standard puck storage. And so this design here goes inside of the standard cassette uh, loading capsule or vessel. And you can then transfer clipped grids from uh, grid boxes into the cassette. The cassette then um, can be sealed in place using this protective lid and then transferred using the same set of tongs that you use to move the other pucks around. And uh, the vision being that this will allow users to one, prepare their clip grids at their facility and then uh, if they have a, uh, glaciers screen their grids with an auto loader and then send the same grids off for data collection at a high power microscope or to just clip and prepare their grids and send them off for data collection. Um, so in that step, uh, another novel technology that, that we brought online uh, through NanoSoft is this auto grid inspection tool. So if you're familiar with grid, grid clipping, you've got these tiny three millimeter grids, you're trying to handle them under liquid nitrogen and you're trying to put essentially uh, so, so these metal uh, grommets around the outside. And that can be a challenging process and that can lead to grid damage or maybe the clipping is not perfect. And uh, the side effect of that is if you take a poorly clipped grid and stick it into the cassette, which subsequently goes to an auto loader and it jams it up, that that's going to be microscope downtime. And that's what everybody fears is uh, that the microscopes can get jammed up. And so this simple tool here allows you to do a, a final inspection of your grid prior to sticking it into the cassette. You can take your grid, uh, your clip grid, flip it back and forth, make sure there's no signs of damage, that everything's clipped appropriately, and then you can transfer it into the cassette. And these inspection tools fit into any standard cryo grid box holder. So whether it is uh, for this um, cassette loading station insert or whether it was for our puck that has these cryo grid box for the cassette loading, um, it's fully compatible with either. And so this really helps prevent microscope downtime and helps make sure that you're collecting data on the best possible samples that you have. And it's a pretty simple uh, last step to check. Uh, so another area where we've heard about pain points is just in general uh, sample identification. So how do you keep track of which grid is where? And so all of our grid boxes, in addition to the standard serialization, come with a, a barcode that matches that serialization. And uh, we've also just brought online grid boxes that have barcoding on them. And so these data matrices or these 2D barcodes are easily read using just a standard off the shelf USB or wireless uh, barcode scanner. And these scanners act as simple keyboard inputs. So whatever spreadsheet you're used to using or whatever uh, limbs that you have, you just 
point at whatever cell you're trying to fill, use the, the barcode scanner, and it will put the alphanumeric sequence that correlates to whatever the individual sample is into that. And so uh, we, it was simple for us to bring this online when we brought the PUCS online. And the, um, this is some standard, standardly used in crystallography in a variety of uh, locations. And so we're starting to see some of the larger cryo-EM facilities adopt a barcoding method and reading these barcodes because it's much easier than trying to understand what tiny writing some user put on their cryo grid box or uh, which puck did they have. And so, so the more you can take out human error, uh, the better in terms of keeping track of which samples are where, because these cryo M facilities are, as you can imagine, super busy and lots of users coming in and out. Um, so real quick, just some other things, some other tools that we offer for cryo EM that are simple, uh, but really helpful. Um, we offer a variety of different grid box tweezers or uh, uh, clamps that allow you to pick up grid boxes easily. Um, so they just have the grid box tweezers have a rounded out uh, profile that allows you to grip the screws or the pin type lids very securely with just a standard tweezer action. Um, we've just brought online metal grid boxes, which um, are designed to, to provide a couple of benefits. One of the benefit is decreased static charging. So if you've ever dealt with statically charged grids that are clinging to the inside lid of your grid box, or you're trying to move this precious sample around, uh, that can be quite frustrating. And so uh, the, the material used for these metal grid boxes is less prone to charging than plastic is. Uh, in addition, these can be washed, autoclave, decontaminated and reused, uh, and they're less prone to damage and um, they can ideally be individually laser marked. Uh, we brought online um, through, through our partnership with Nanosoft some uh, tweezer and uh, clipping tool repair services. So tweezers for the VitroBot are not cheap and so they're very fragile on the ends and users, particularly new users to CryoEM can bang and ding these things up uh, rather than having to spend uh, hundreds of dollars to replace them um, or thousands in, in some cases, you can just get those, those tips refined and repaired and get them back to holding grids uh, safely and securely. Um, other things in the pipeline that are really useful for CryoEM and that have some overlap from our crystallography is just foam doers. So getting rid of glass, uh, glass doers, things that can break in the lab, utilizing foam doers to handle liquid nitrogen uh, are just safety and more secure and they last. The, we offer a large variety of cryogenic storage and handling equipment and um, a bunch of uh, nice stereo microscopes through Carl Zeiss that allow you for you know, inspecting your grids prior to loading the sample or um, just, just general microscopy approaches. Um, so uh, that, that said, um, prior to transitioning to what I will call the virtual booth portion of, of this, um, I would welcome any questions that anyone has. All right. So now everyone should be able to uh, hear me and see me over here. Um, so I'm uh, just going to walk through everything we just talked about, but actually show you them, manipulate them a little bit. And so the first thing we talked about were that we offer uh, a lot of the standard accessories for, for CryoEM, which would be grids. So uh, you know, here's a variety of ultrafoil or quantifoil grids that uh, we have in stock. Um, so we've got a lot of these grid boxes floating around. Uh, and then we have cryogenic grid boxes. This would be uh, the metal one we just talked about. Um, but in addition, we offer the, the standard uh, blue and white, as well as uh, one from Swiss C with some, some uh, adhesive labeling on them. And so a variety of grid boxes. Uh, and so, so we would love to be your supplier for grids and or grid boxes. Um, the, from there, the, the first thing we talked about was the, the ethane condenser from the folks at Nanosoft. And so it's got a um, retention bearing there that allows it to affix into the spider so it's held securely. You would then have an ethane cup here that you load. This attaches to your, your cylinder. And you can then fill this with one hand being manipulating the valve and another hand free without having to hold something in place here. Um, so this is a, a handy little tool that these guys have developed. Um, the next thing we talked about was uh, the igloo. And so the igloo comes with a, a front actuating magnetic retention uh, cover and a cover that goes on top to help control the environment. So what you would do is uh, after, after doing a standard plunge, you can then take this, uh, bring it onto your doer, 
and cover it up and let it sit so that you get uh, a stabilized environment inside the um, inside the system. Uh, you can then plunge or manipulate it. The, the cryo tweezers themselves, um, which are here, um, can then be stored uh, in the in the Cobra here, and you can then transfer your grids from liquid ethane over to the uh, liquid nitrogen and into a cryo grid box without worry about pulling them up too high and exposing them to ambient temperature. And so uh, it's a really useful just to be able to let that set and uh, allow things to stabilize. And so, um, so that's the igloo and that, you know, as, as far as our, our Mitogen's mantra in terms of eliminating any variable that could possibly decrease the consistency from sample to sample, uh, this is a really useful tool. Um, you know, just from the improving the workflow and the ease of use, I'll show you a little bit more about these cryo tweezers. So this is the clamping mechanism that would be attached to the, the plunger. Unfortunately, I don't have a Vitrobot here to, to show you the, the mechanics of that, but um, this would simply slide on and then you can open and close it for easier removal rather than trying to fight that metal clamp on. And then um, these tweezers here have the positive action that are just naturally in a state of, of gripping the grids. All right. Um, so next, I talked a bit about our, our storage pucks for, for CryoEM. So I'm going to move over here this, um, this storage doer. So this, so this is, sorry, is not a storage doer, this is a liquid nitrogen doer, and this is what we call a puck doer insert. And so um, you'd fill this with liquid nitrogen and you would then um, transfer your grid boxes into this system and you can easily manipulate your grid boxes. So, for the puck itself, uh, clear a fixed lid, it's permanently fixed, easily rotates from any individual well. So you can then transfer a grid box into whichever location that you want, or move a grid box here because you want uh, a sample in that position here, and then transfer a sample over here. So the puck coupled with these tweezers that I showed make those manipulations quite easy. Once you've filled your puck and you've got all of the wells full that you desire, you can rotate the lid into the position where the locking rod and the locking screw are in place. You simply back out this screw. And then using these tongs, you can grab the front of the puck itself. And I'll slide that out of the way. And so this is an empty storage cane that comes with uh, a locking rod. The locking rod gets removed and can be easily removed with one hand. The puck itself can then get slid in. And as I mentioned before, um, there's a magnetic retention mechanism that makes it so that even with the locking rod out, the pucks are not going anywhere. Um, so that you can easily pull this system out, set it on the edge of your doer, grab your tongs, grab your puck, transfer it into a liquid nitrogen doer or transfer it to a separate cane or to a transport cane without worry about um, warming up your sample. So once those are there, the locking rod would go back into place and this would just get stored in a standard uh, liquid nitrogen doer like an HC34 or an HC35. We make uh, canes for every style of those. Just tell us which ones you're using when you order them and we'll get you exactly what you need. Here is a full set of pucks. Um, they, are, they come in either rainbow colored or individually colored. Uh, each of them have individual barcodes, which uh, with a standard barcode scanner, you can just read. That would provide a text input into your um, limbs or spreadsheet. And so each one is individually identified through uh, those markings there. Uh, a cane holds 10 pucks, even with all 10 pucks in there and the locking rod out. Uh, it's easy to see that that magnetic retention is not going to let them fall out. Um, in addition, I showed you the, the barcoded cryo grid box. Um, so now is a good time to just show you that as well. Again, standard barcode scanner can read the affixed barcode and you can keep track of your grids without having to try to read what it was that uh, your, your uh, colleague had tried to handwrite on uh, before they were rushing to, to prep samples. Um, so then the, um, the next tool that I can show you would be the uh, auto grid cassette box. So this is a uh, auto grid cassette uh, loading station. And 
So typically it would come with a uh, particular insert uh, in it that holds the cassette and the grid boxes like I showed you in the auto grid inspection image. But here um, you can using the using the standard tools, you can transfer in an auto grid cassette. You could then transfer gr clipped grids from your cryo grid boxes into the cassette. Uh, this lid then rotates just like the puck. It locks in place just like the puck and can then uh, be transferred from here into uh, a shipping or a storage doer, or you can then receive a auto grid cassette puck and then um, using the standard mechanics, open it back up securely, take uh, the transfer tool and then transfer it into say the, the capsule for loading the auto mounter or auto loader. Um, so in addition to that, um, I talked about the uh, auto grid inspection station. And so I will try to get this the focal point where you can actually see it. But um, this is designed to be inserted into any one of these wells and allows users to easily flip back and forth their, um, their grid. And so uh, you can inspect for clipping and make sure that everything looks good prior to transferring that into the cassette. And so this would go in any location where you could stick a standard cryo grid box, whether it is in uh, this puck or whether it is in the, the standard loading station for the uh, grid cassette. Um, so that covers uh, the, the large majority of um, the things that I was interested in showing you. Um, so I'm gonna jump back to the other camera now and uh, take any questions that you guys might have. Uh, and I would love to hear about whether or not there's other pain points in your lab, other things you're dealing with for sample prep and cryo EM that you really wish that a company might address or um, anything we might be able to do to make your lives better. Um, so I'm back here um, at, at this viewing station. I want to um, make sure that anyone who has any questions is, is free to ask them. Um, and if you're having trouble getting unmuted, do feel free to uh, just chat a message in the, in the general chat. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm here to, to take any questions that you guys might have. All right, great. Um, well, it looks like I'm not getting uh, any questions because so uh, some some common questions that we'll often hear from users. Oh, sorry, I've got a question here. Oh yes, so uh, oh great, uh, a couple of questions. So uh, Song Yi, you ask, uh, does the igloo go into the vitro bot when plunge freezing, or need to take the tweezer and cup out of the vitro bot and then put the igloo on? Um, so that's a great question. And uh, so my understanding, and I'll see if uh, Mike is still on this call, because uh, uh, Mike Godfrey, who is the, the developer of the technology, was, was on this video call. Um, he's welcome to, to, to answer this. But my understanding is that you would put the igloo on post plunge freezing and prior to transferring. Um, and so that, that's my understanding. Um, and if I'm... <laughs> Mike, if, I, if you need to correct me, I'll pipe in too. Yeah, and that, that's exactly right, Ben. That's correct. Um, so it's once, you, so you can't keep the igloo on indefinitely because um, if you're familiar with the vitrobot, uh, um, as the doer gets lifted up to the bottom of the box where the controlled environment is, uh, there's no room between the top of the doer and the box. So you need to take it off for the actual vitrification. And then we like to just slip it around the tweezers immediately after just to have as much time controlling that environment, offering that, that maximum um, protection from moisture. And then you can do the transfer. And then even between samples, if you're doing some other type of sample prep, et cetera, between grids, then we like to keep it on and, and throw the little cover just to, to offer maximum uh, protection. Yes, yeah, so you're trying to keep moisture out of the cryogens because moisture getting into liquid nitrogen is gonna be one way that you can get grids contaminated. Um, and so certain, and another one of the questions was um, that stating that they often get grids with ice or, or ice damage. 
uh, and what suggestions we might have there. Um, certainly trying to control the variables that are involved in sample transfers. Um, so anytime that you're moving your grid from liquid ethane or the, uh, whatever the, the primary cryogen is into liquid uh, nitrogen, those transfers where you're going into this cold ambient air, you really want to make certain that you're keeping that environment consistent. Something like the igloo can make a world of difference, uh, making sure it's a good cold gas layer above those cryogens so that when you're transferring, you only want to just bring it out of the liquid and then transfer it gently over and put it back in the liquid because exposure to that ambient, if there's a little bit of turbulence or if there's moisture, you can get uh, contamination there. And then subsequently, um, if you're doing other transfers, so if you're transferring from one grid box to another, or if you're using a clipping station, or if you're transferring clip grids, um, I don't know exactly where your ice is coming from, which step, but all of those steps, anytime that you're working with a liquid cryogen, you want to keep it covered up unless you're actively working in it, because if you start to get uh, moisture inside that liquid, it's going to get pulled in from the environment, and then it's going to want to nucleate on samples that you're transferring around. Uh, we've seen this in crystallography a bunch as well. And so um, the best way to prevent ice damage um, is to just keep moisture out of the cryogen and to keep the environment right above your cryogen as moisture-free as possible and as controlled. Um, certainly, if you're changing temperatures, if it's warming up and cooling back down, you're going to get uh, some changing in freezing. You could see crystalline ice. Um, uh, another question is, uh, will I be sending out a link for the video? Um, I, I believe so. Um, our marketing guy is, is handling the recording and the distribution after that. Um, and so I, I don't see any reason why we can't share that link. Uh, I think it's being recorded on the cloud currently, so hopefully we can, we can share that with you. Any questions from anybody else? Well, I, I, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, I hope that uh, you know, if you have questions, feel free. Um, I'll make sure my email gets disseminated out uh, so that you guys all, all have contact directly to me. Um, so again, I'm Ben, I'm the Chief Operating Officer here. I oversee all sorts of things, but I'm happy to fill in uh, on the, the sales and marketing side today and, and give this presentation. Um, we've got some really interesting stuff that we're gonna be developing. Uh, hopefully we have some stuff launched both for crystallography and cryoEM uh, in the next month or so. And uh, we're going to plan to be in some shape or form involved in both the MM meeting and the ACA meeting. Uh, and so I uh, hope to see you guys there in, in, in some capacity. And uh, do feel free to reach out though with any questions. Uh, if you have interest in any of these technologies, we would love to work with you. We'd love to help get your CryoVM lab up and running and uh, get information out to you guys. And so we're uh, really appreciative of you guys taking some time to tune in. And uh, at that, I'll, I'll sign off uh, if no one else has any questions and, and say uh, thanks. Thanks, everybody.